in real life, and I'll present this to you, you have somebody, whether it's your spouse, your partner, your good friend, he lies to you once. All right, you know, you give him a pass, you know. He lies to you a second time, you start to, hey, what's going on here? A third time, you're practically ready to cut him loose, especially right. if it's something right. important. And it and if it continues, you're not going to have this guy in your sight. You, you want to you wanna cut ties with him. And I look at today, so many people accept lies from people, like it's normal. Yeah. Welcome to the Palminteri Francis Podcast. This is Charles Palminteri. The wise. And Michael Francis, the wise guy. Michael, we're going to get back to Machiavelli. We've been studying Machiavelli each week. You know, a lot of wise guys, right? That was required reading. You went to prison, you had to read The Prince. The treatise by Machiavelli was almost required reading. Really? Yes. That's, that's amazing. The amazing thing you said before we get into some of the rules, some of his quotes, you thought it was his way of showing people how bad the government could be. What I finally realized is that Machiavelli made this treatise public. Right. And basically, he was explaining or he was counseling the prince how to maintain control of his kingdom. But the things that he was teaching the prince, being that it was public and realizing at one point in time that he was actually oppressed by the government, I felt that Machiavelli was really trying to alert the people as how as to how the government could operate. He was preparing them. He was preparing yeah, them. Yeah, because some of the things that he said, people would be shocked by it. Wow. I remember one of the quotes... I'll never forget this. It, it just stuck in my head when I read it. He said, the promise made was a necessity of the past. The promise broken is a necessity of the present. It's brilliant. And, you know, it's, look, how many times have people oh. made promises, you know, because they wanted something. Right. We talk about our government. I mean, we have to look at it that way. Right. And then they get into office, they get our votes, and they break yeah, right. the promise. Exactly. How about, uh, you know, Bush, read my lips, no new taxes. Well, exactly. that didn't work out too well. Didn't work out. And you know what? But the good thing about that is people held him accountable. They, they booted him out him of account. office. But I got to say, even uh, Obama, you can keep your own doctor. Yeah. That didn't work out too well. He's so your you're own right. doctor. I mean, that is true to this day. I mean, here, one of his one of his rules. There is no avoiding war. It can only be postponed to the advantage of the others. Now, in wise guy element, if you had to go to war, would they try to go to war or they would try to hold back, Michael? Well, you know, normally a war is over leadership. When you become boss of a family, it's not there's no election process. It's a coup. You want to be boss, you got to take the other boss out. Most of the time, unless somebody's so old that they retire. But most of the time, it's somebody wants that position for whatever reason, and they have to take it by force. So they're not trying to avoid war at that point. They're actually creating war or uh, bringing a war on. Whoa. And it's for power and leadership. I mean, would you think that's true with the government, too? There is no avoid. I think so. If you look at, there is no a a avoiding war. Look, at when, when Hitler was, um, you know, attacking England. And I forgot the, the prime minister's name when he said, oh, with peace, 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 we're going to have peace. You know, Churchill knew there's no avoiding war. What are you doing? You're just postponing it. Well, sooner or later, there's no negotiations when you have your head in the tiger's mouth, he said. Exactly. And he's right. He was, he was 100% right. Churchill was smart, and he knew it. And listen, war is, is profitable for some. Let's, let's face it. Normally, the person that goes to war, it's profitable for I think, you know, even in... Um, in the situation with Russia and Ukraine, there are people suffering, but it's profitable for Russia. They had a plan. I don't think it turned out the way they wanted it to. I don't think they expected that Ukraine was going to put up the fight that they put up. No way they didn't, they didn't expect they that. They underestimated the, uh, right. the, the will of, the, of, of Ukraine. But um, in other terms, it was profitable for them. Look what happened with the, you know oil and gas. Look what they did. They profited from that. Uh, yeah, I, I think Machiavelli. Look, so many things that he said were so right on point. I mean, presidents read Machiavelli. Yes, absolutely. Presidents, yeah, one, another one of his rules. Whoever is the cause of another becoming powerful is ruined himself. A prince never lacks legitimate reasons to break his promise. Oh, yeah, because he, cre <laughs> he creates those reasons, you know? You know, you know what, Chaz? So if you're the boss, you can do whatever you yeah, want. You can do whatever you want. You know what gets me in real life? And I'll present this to you. You have somebody, whether it's your spouse, your partner, your good friend, he lies to you once. Yeah. All right. You know, you give him a pass, you know. He lies to you a second time. You start to, hey, what's going on here? Right. A third time, you're practically ready to cut him loose, especially right. if it's something right. important. And it and if it continues, you're not going to have this guy in your sight. You, you want to you cut ties with him. 
And I look at today, so many people accept lies from people. Like, it's normal. Yeah. In politics. Oh, it's, it's politics. It's politics. Well, what does that mean? It's not politics. It's lying. I mean, I don't understand how these people in politics, they say these things about each other. Then the next minute, they're pals. They're running, they're running with each other. What does that tell you? A lot of backdoor stuff going on. A lot of backroom stuff going on. I mean, I remember when Kamala Harris said, look, she called Joe Biden a racist. And the next minute, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work, Joe. He thought to his advantage to have her as vice president. So what he said, what she said didn't matter at that point. That's politics. But doesn't what you say matter? In the mob, Michael, were people known to be backstabbers or people known his word is good? If he said that, if Junior said that, or this guy said that, or, or the chin said it, his word is good. Did anybody have a good word? Yes. I relied on people's words, and uh, I didn't pay a bad price for it. People that, that gave their word to me most of the time, people on the top, they kept their word. They did. I found out something in that life, Chaz. Guys that were ready to pull the trigger quick, they didn't last. All those guys that had that kind of reputation, when it came their time, they were in trouble. Because, you know, even guys that were legitimate tough guys, I mean, these were scary guys. These were guys who would put a bullet in your head as soon as look at you. Like DeMeo and guys like yeah, that? Yeah, well, what happens? You don't want these guys around. You don't want guys around that are cowboys and that you can't trust right. and you don't know what they're going to do, so you eliminate them. Every one of those guys that had that kind of reputation, they're all gone. You get rid of them. But if you were a guy that, okay, let me think about this, you know, I'm reasonable, you got a shot with me, well, then you lasted. The other guys, they didn't last. You know, there was this guy, he, said, he wrote a, he put a graph on a, on a board and he said, how Navy SEALs, SEAL Team 6, pick the best of the best of the best. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's not about who's the most courageous. It's not about who's the smartest. He goes, you could have the most courageous, but if he's not trustworthy, no. You'd rather have somebody that's pretty courageous and very trustworthy. He said they will go as far as to say someone who is not even that skilled but really trustworthy, they'd rather have him. Trust was the most important element, how they pick the people in team, uh, in SEAL Team 6. Trust. I agree with that. You don't have to be the most capable. Uh, you don't have to be the best shot. Not even the most courageous, but somebody you can trust. I agree with that. On the street, it's the same way. You want to have people around you that you know you can rely on. When push comes to shove, they're going to have your back. They're not going to give you up. And that's tough on the street. On the street. <laughs> that's very I'm tough. I'm sorry, Michael, but on the street, that's really hard. It's very tough. Jazz, honestly, because somebody's always looking for something. And if they can benefit themselves by selling you out, Look, I hate to say this. There was a guy around my dad. His name was Joey. I won't go into any further. He knew my father 44 years. Best of friends. During the war, I remember this. I was five years old, Chaz. But you know how things stick out in your head right. sometimes? I'm five years old during the first gallo profaci War. My father was gone for a couple of days. He comes... Uh, we were at my grandmother's house. He didn't even have us staying at home because during that war, a lot of guys were getting hurt. Right. So he didn't want to come to the house, so he had to stand by my grandmother's house. He shows up, and he's got a full beard because he hadn't shaved in a couple of days. What was going on? Joey was on the front porch, like, watching God to make sure nothing happened to my Joey dad. Joey Gallo. No, no. This, this guy, I can see oh, Joey Brancata. He was a war hero. He had one leg. He had his leg shot off in the war. But love my father would have done anything for him, right? My dad goes to jail. Three or four years later, Joey turned on him. My dad looked at me and said, I know this guy 44 years. We were like brothers. And it was shocking to me because I called him Uncle Joe. I knew him my whole life. But he turned on my dad. So, you know, I say this all the time, man. Money and power is such a, a, a powerful aphrodisiac. It really is. Wow. When people think they have it in their, in their hand, they don't want to let it go. And, uh, you know, my father warned me of that. And he, he also told me, but he was shocked. Even uh, he was shocked. He said, Mike, I don't understand. And if he turned on him, what happened to him? Well, he ended up, he did a foolish thing. Remember what I said? When you become boss in that family, there's no election. You either take the top spot right. and get rid of the guy. He tried to do a coup without taking the boss over. He got defeated. And they put him on a shelf. He wow. lost his... They didn't whack him. No. He lost his captaincy. He lost his soldier. They didn't whack him because of my father. My father sent word and said, don't kill him. And they just put him on the shelf, which is almost... Now, uh, now from what I know, <clears throat> your father had a great reputation. He did. As far as a stand-up guy. He did. No doubt. Put me in jail for 50 years. He ain't ratting. Let me tell you something. I always said this. My dad's legacy in that life meant everything to him. You know, look, Chaz, between you and I, well, between everybody, I may as well reveal it. My dad used to get a hold of me and said, Michael, you know this life is foolish. You know that, right? 
Yeah, he, just me and him. He said this and that, and everybody's going to tell you this. You got to watch for everybody. So I don't care who it is. Watch for everybody. But outwardly, he wanted to be the most stand up. He's dying with his boots on, and he did. 50 years would never talk to the, never say a word. It just wasn't in his makeup. He couldn't do it. But the flip side of wow. that, Chaz, now I, I leave this up for people to decide. Wow. The flip side of that is my dad sacrificed our entire family. And he never understood that. He got mad at me one time when I said to him, Dad, do you realize you destroyed, our lifestyle destroyed this family? He would not take responsibility for it. I think it hurt him too much. He said, no, I was framed. If I wasn't framed, none of this would have happened. I said, Dad, you weren't yeah, framed yeah. because you were a doctor, a lawyer, or a priest. You were framed <laughs> right. because you were a wise guy. But, you yeah. know, I mean, I understood where he was coming from. But look, this, is, right. this was his principle, and he kept it. Another one of Machiavelli's rules. Men are so simple and so much inclined to obey immediate needs that a deceiver will never lack victims for his deceptions. Oh, I love that one. Yes, yeah, satisfy me now. Satisfy me now. Yeah. Instant gratification. Yes, and if you know that in somebody, it's such a powerful weapon against them. Think about it. I know what this guy needs. I know what he wants right now. I can lure him into something, deceive him, and I'll get what I want out of him. That's wow. powerful. This is so much for wise guys. I can't get 100%. over it. It's almost more for wise guys than politicians, really. Well, maybe I don't know not. About that. Yeah. No, well, no, yeah. no. Let's. No, I'm giving way. the politicians too much credit. You're right. It is for wise guys. No, but you're but right. Politicians yeah. use it well. They, they just hide it, well. it more. Exactly. Well, exactly. Oh, here's another one. Here, here's a great one. Machiavelli was this guy ahead of his time or what? When you disarm your subjects, however, you offend them by showing that either from cowardice or lack of faith, you distrust you distrust them, and either conclusion will induce them to hate you, and either conclusion will induce them to hate you. It's true. Look, when you take away guns from people, you're saying to them, "I don't trust you," or "I don't have faith in you." I mean, that's why I do believe in the Second Amendment. Machiavelli said, another one of his quotes, when you disarm the people, automatically you distrust them. That's what he said. Well, you're showing them that. You're showing them I don't trust you. And the problem with that is you're showing law-abiding, legitimate people that you don't trust them. We obviously don't trust criminals. Right. But law-abiding, legitimate right. people... Jazz, I want to say this. I think, you know, as long as we're talking about this, I think there could be some reform in some of the gun laws. I believe that. Yeah, I don't think an 18-year-old should be able to have a, an assault weapon. I, that's right. And they should go into his social media before exactly. they give anybody. I, I believe in all of that. But I will say this. If you take guns away from legitimate people, the only people that are going to have them is the criminals. There you go. Jazz, I could have had any gun I wanted on the street. There's a black market for, for guns out there that people don't understand. Right. I don't even know if the politicians understand it. Any gun I wanted in 24 hours, I would have had in my hand. Anything. I don't care what it was. Anything. I could have had hand grenades. I could have had assault <sighs> weapons. I could have had shotguns and pistols. Whatever I ordered, I would have gotten. Wow. And so how could you take the guns out of the hands of legitimate people and put them on the street with all the criminals? Yeah, I mean, people don't realize that. I mean, you guys, you don't realize that. I read these magazines that I think from one to two million incidences a year, people save themselves and their family Absolutely. because they had a gun. Yeah, and you don't you hear that. You never see that. But it's true. Look, I was on the street. I can't tell you how many times. I, I can give you specifics. They were going to go rob a house. Guys on a, with art, certain art in the house. Well, did they have guns in the house? Are these people armed? Because if they were, they passed on the house. They went to another they house. They went someplace else. I mean, I was I was involved in those <laughs> conversations. There. I know it for a fact. Are you hearing, folks? He was there. Why do we got to mess with these people? They're armed, you know, because they watch them. They case the house. They know the guy. Yeah. We'll go next door. We'll go down. We'll find somebody else. We don't shot. need the headache. Yeah. I, uh, who needs the headache? We got to start shooting people because we want a piece of art. Let's go somewhere else. Exactly like that. Another Machiavelli quote. It is not titles that honor men, but men that honor titles. I love that. You know what, Chaz? I say this all the time, too. You could be a boss and not be a leader. In my opinion, a leader is only a leader when people want to follow that person willingly. That's leadership. And you can not be a boss and still be a leader because you have that quality that people, they want to follow you. Right. But because you're a boss doesn't mean you're a leader. It means you're a supervisor. And they got to listen to you because you have a title. Doesn't mean they want to follow you. Out of all the bosses that you knew, Michael, besides Junior and everybody else, who do you think was the most respected boss? The most powerful boss during my time was definitely Chin Gigante. Chin. Yeah. 
He, he uh, you know what was was strange about him and a guy by the name of Fritzy Giovanelli. Did you know Fritzy? He was a big bookmaker. I know who he is. Yes. Yeah, great guy. I was very close with him. He's actually the guy that took me to meet Chin. Chin wanted to say hello to me. He loved right. my dad. I was told. Right. Respected my dad. And Chin didn't meet with everybody. Chin didn't care who you were. He didn't care who you were. Didn't matter. That's you could right. have been the boss. You could have been. If he didn't want to meet you, he didn't meet you. He ain't End the story. Right. That's power. Because he said, hey, this is how it is. Like it or don't like it. And he had the grip on his family. And if Fat Tony was capable, I don't want you to think he was just a puppet there. But he consulted with Chin on anything major. No no question about it. And I respected Chin. I really did. I, I, you yeah, know, he, was re- he was feared, too. He was feared. I mean, he was, he was a real guy. I mean, that's how they got the thing where you couldn't say his name. You had to go. You had to go like this. Yeah, that's you how had to go got like that. Name. Because if... You said his name on tape, punishable by death. You're in trouble, absolutely. If he heard his name on tape and he heard you said his name. You're in trouble. I'll never forget, I walked up and down Houston Street with him, and he was in his bathrobe the whole thing, and we walked up and down, and we had a very lucid conversation about things. And, uh, you know, I don't have to repeat what he said. I'll tell you what he did do, which was a compliment to me, and it came out of nowhere. He said to me, Mike, if you ever have trouble where you are and you want to be part of my family, you're a captain in my family. The fact that he said that, I said, wait a second, you know, how could he do that? But that made me real. He wouldn't make a statement like that. So that to me showed me the kind of power that he had, that he would have went to my boss at the time and said, hey, he's coming with me. Yeah, I remember downtown when his brother Lewis was running for uh-huh. a position, pamphlets, uh-huh. vote for Lewis Gigante. Right. And when we ran out of pamphlets, store owners were coming out going, you don't have a pamphlet? And we said, no, you got to do something. <laughs> and we say, no, no, we don't. We- we don't have any more. They, they got cardboard and wrote, they copied the pamphlet and oh, put yeah. a magic mark and put it in the window because they didn't want to offend Chin. Wanted to make sure that Chin knew they were supporting his brother. Yeah. Machiavelli again here. It's just incredible, Machiavelli. Few men are brave by nature, but good discipline and experience make many so. Wow. I agree with that. Hey, that's, that's what a, an effective military teaches you how to be courageous. Yeah, they teach you that. Yeah, yeah. because I study, I do training. I, I like to mm-hmm. shoot. I'm a big gun person. I shoot three, three guns, pistol, mm-hmm. a shotgun. And when I train, with, I train with the FBI. I train with some people from Mossad, from Israel. And it was really great because what they said to me was, you can't go, I'm trying to remember exactly what that guy said to me. You can't go somewhere physically until you go there in the mind. And I well, didn't understand it right away, but then he says, the ox- the exercises make you realize that you can do this. So then when it does happen, you've been there already. Mm-hmm. So you see it coming. You know how to go there. And that made sense to me. Mm-hmm. And then I knew because when I took some of those courses with the FBI there and me pulling, my, you know, picking up my thing and shooting the gun, it made me stay in my head that if it did have to happen... I could do it Mm -hmm. without, because I saw it in my mind. And I never forgot that when he said that to me. And it really helped me a lot. I agree. Listen, everybody that gets drafted into the military is not a, uh, is not courageous. A lot of people go in there, maybe they're scared and there's there's nothing wrong with that, but they teach you how to be courageous in the military. I, I totally agree with that. And you know, I also believe one thing, Chad, I think every young man, I don't want to say women yet, Okay, I can't help it. That's just my, right. my... But I think every young man should do time in the military. Israel, you got to do it. Men uh, and women. Men and women. In Israel? Yes. Both. And I think it's great. It's great right. discipline. It's great right. training. You know, a lot of our young people lack that today. I believe in drafting yeah. everybody. I Two believe years. that. Yeah, another one of Machiavelli. There is simply no comparison between a man who is armed and one who is not. <laughs> it is simply unreasonable to expect that an armed man should obey one who is unarmed, and that an unarmed man should remain safe and secure when his servants are armed. This that's, guy would... that's as simple as you can get, right? I mean, it makes so much sense. You know what strikes me? How does one guy come up with so much brilliance? And even if you don't agree with him, Chaz, you got to say, how, how does he come up? How does he come up with that shit? And I know what I say to him? That's why we're talking about it after 500 years. Yes, exactly. That's why. Because if I came up with this shit, 500 years from now, you and I, they'll be talking about it. It's so important to listen to what people have. You know, listen to instruction. Machiavelli tells you that. You can learn so much i think i think a lot of that is lost in today's day and age because every everybody's in a hurry we're on the internet all the time we're looking for information right. instant gratification if it's not at our fingertips we pass right. we go on to something else but right to pay attention to somebody like this right. who, how, how many years ago hundreds of years hundreds ago. of years was and Chaz, 
I got to tell you this. The book of Proverbs, something that we're going to talk about. We're going to do that book too. That's right. Thousands of years Thousands ago. Thousands of years ago. If you follow the wisdom in the book of Proverbs, you cannot go wrong. I mean, folks, we're on Machiavelli now. We're going to go to the seven habits of highly successful people. We're going to go to, we're going to, go to the best advice ever given by all great people. We're going, to, we're going to speak about the five things you have to do, you have to know before you die. A lot of these great books that Michael and I are going to give our perspective on it. And um, let's do a couple more before we go, Michael. Sure. For the, oh, this is good. For the mob is always impressed by appearance and by result. And the world is composed of the mob. I don't think they were talking about our mob. No. <laughs> they mean, yeah. The masses. Really. The masses. The masses. He said the word mob. I right. agree with that. I think yeah, that's I very that. wise. Yeah. My father always said, if you follow the mob, the mob will never follow you, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. So I always try to follow. beat at my own drum. You know, that's what you do. Leader. leader, not a follower. I try to be just a leader, not a follower. And you were, you know? Chaz, because look, you had many opportunities. I know you were approached during your time when you were coming up. Yeah. Guys from my from my former life wanted to be involved with you. Yes. Have you involved with them? Yes. And you just said no. It was no. the smartest thing you ever did. Smartest thing I ever said. And That's one of the proudest moments of my life. And I'm not putting no you know halos on myself or saying that I was this brave person. I think it was more just I think it was just more just pissed off and arrogance. How dare you think you can get a piece of me now you know and i was michael and you know i mean this mm -hmm. i was ready to take a fucking bullet and i would have said fuck and i don't mean to use that language but no i'm not doing it and that that if you they would have pressed me i would have said do what you have to do mm -hmm. but i'm not doing it i'm not doing it i was not going to give a piece there's one thing i did know from growing up with the mob you can't say yes then turn your mind and say no no that you can't do once these words come to you you're with me that's it that's it lifelong commitment lifelong commitment you know that absolutely so i was like but you, you know, know chaz the, the flip side of that when word went back to somebody of meaning and that was important he said let it go he said let it go because I want people to think and to know, rather, that everybody in that life wasn't some kind of street thug looking to put the arm on somebody. No. It was some people that respect meant something. And if somebody with respect stood up to them in a respectful way, they got respect. I was very return. respectful. Yes. And I just said I didn't need it. And thank you. And, and I think he said, you know what? We don't need it. Yeah. We don't need the headache. And he's a good kid. We know him from the neighborhood. And mm -hmm. I was from the neighborhood. They knew me since I was a kid. And they just let it go. And there was a guy who... The boss, the big boss, who you know, we'll, we'll mention his name. And I never, and the, uh, and the only thing I never forgot about him was when they whacked his partner out before he became a big boss. Mm -hmm. They whacked his partner out, and he got nervous because they were doing drugs and they were stepping on the drugs. And the bo big bosses were telling him, "Stop stepping on it. Give the ones we get, you know, do it. Just give it the way we give it to you." And then his partner kept stepping. They both stepped on it, and they whacked his partner, and they were going to kill him. I think I told you the story. And he drove up once with all the guys in the car, and I was on the corner. He looked at me. I looked at him. Him. That was the first time in my life I saw, I saw fear in his eyes. Mm. And I said, oh, God, he's whack. He's going to get whacked next. Mm. But I, somehow they spoke to some people and they gave him a pass. So, And then he became a made guy later on. But um, I don't know why I told that story. but It was a good one. It was a good one. That's <laughs> yes. why. Michael, what can we say? This is uh, another episode here of Palmetary Francis, The Wise and The Wise Guy. Michael, you want to sign off? Yeah, and you know, people understand this. We have two different perspectives, even though we both came from the street in one way. Right. Jazz went the right way. I kind of went the wrong way for a while, got that experience. So I have that kind of street perspective, and uh, Chaz kind of cleans it up a little bit, I think, you know, because he did it the right way. But we hope that you benefit by this because these are people, you know, whether you agree with them or not, they have a perspective in life that you should listen to and, and take what you want from it, you know, and hear what we have to say about it, and hopefully you can apply it to your own life and benefit you in some way. And, and that's what this is all about. And we're going to just keep quoting some of these people. And look, Machiavelli was brilliant. You agree with him, disagree with him. He was brilliant. We're still quoting him you know s several hundred years later so right. uh we hope you get the most out of it absolutely god bless you we'll see you next week got it